and then when you start to talk, you can, yeah. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Uh, hello, Bruce. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, thank you for joining the Fab Academy recitations. It's a great honor to have you with us. I think you don't need further int introductions, um, but just to let you know that we are really excited in the FabLab network to count with your voice um, within this um, young group of uh, visionary people that want to use technology to change the world. And I, I think that you know a little bit about that. <laughs> and you thought about that some years ago. Um, so it's great to put these worlds together um, through this amazing hangout. So thank you very much. And FabLab Network, I give you Bruce Mao. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here. And I think you'll see that um, what I'm working on right now is absolutely connected to what you're doing. Um, and I want to take a little bit of time to really um, tell a story about how I kind of got to this way of thinking and working, um, and then really focus on a few of the things that I'm, uh, I'm working on now. Um, so I've prepared some, um, some images that we, can, um, that we can go through to really um, get started. Uh, I need to share my screen one second. Um, so, what I want to do is um, is really, um, as I mentioned, um, speak a little bit about you know how uh, how my work, my own work, has evolved and um, entered into this place where um, where digital and real come together. It's really the kind of intersection of the digital world and the physical world, and I really think that that is an absolutely enormous opportunity. It's one of the, I think, one of the biggest opportunities in human history. Uh, if we can really understand the synthesis of digital and physical, um, there's a there's a, uh, a very big potential there. So I want to talk a little bit about um, an exhibition that just opened recently in Philadelphia at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, once a year, they award the Design Excellence Award, and this year, uh, I was honored to be chosen for that award. And along with that comes an exhibition. It's really an exhibition, uh, often of the, you know, the history of the work. Um, and my interest was actually in the future of the work, and really understanding, you know, what's going to happen in the next thirty years, uh, not the last thirty years. Um, and what I wanted to do really was to focus on. Um, the principles of a new kind of design um, that we call massive change design. It's really um, a new era that I think Fab Labs is very, very much you know in the center of. Um, that is driven by purpose and um, and synthesizing possibility. It's really understanding what all the new technologies offer us uh, as an opportunity. Uh, and trying to understand what the biggest potential contribution is that we can make. Um, and so one of those principles is work on what you love. And it seems like a very kind of light and almost superficial idea, um, but it's actually the most profound question that we face as designers, that we have the capacity to shape the world. Um, so often I meet young designers who are struggling to understand how they can actually do the things that they love. Um, and when they see the work that I do, they, they realize that somehow I've managed to do that. I've managed to make a life um, that is absolutely extraordinary, I have to say, um, where I really focus on the biggest opportunities and the, and the things that I'm most passionate about um, and, and really use the, you know, the power that I have uh, to make the world a better place. Um, and so that became a kind of central organizing concept. Uh, and it was one of, um, one of a whole um, set of principles um, that are uh, the 24 principles of massive change design. And we organized the show around those principles to say, look, um, there are principles driving the new method. Uh, those, those principles can be learned and applied um, and what we're doing at the Master Change Network is really uh, designing the tools for people to do that. 
um, to access these principles and apply them to their to their business, to their organization, to their government, uh, to their social movement, uh, to their life. Really, it's uh, a set of design thinking tools uh, that is uh, is derived really from 30 years of practice. You know, over over time, um, I realized there was a method that produced this very diverse range of work, uh, and that's really what this is all about. So these are the 24 principles. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but I'm going to touch on a few of them that I think are really relevant. Um, you know, it starts with inspiration. That ultimately, you know, most pe most designers think inspiration is a kind of side effect of their work. Uh, I think it is the fundamental, uh, you know, the, the absolute fundamental of our work. That we can't do things on our own. Everything we do is collaborative. And therefore, our job is to inspire people to go to places that they haven't been uh, and to design solutions to challenges that haven't been solved before. Um, so it really starts with that concept. And then we built a kind of toolkit. You know, it's not a linear process. It's really a creative process. Um, you know, if you have a toolkit, it doesn't say always use the hammer first. Uh, it's really a, a toolkit that you can reach into when you have a problem for a set of tools that might solve that problem. Uh, and that's what, the, that's what this program is really all about. Um, it comes from the insight that we live a designed life, that ultimately, uh, if you think about your experience from womb to tomb, you experience design. Even before you're born, you know, we apply design to your health uh, so that you're healthy and that the mother is healthy. Um, and we apply design to the birth. We apply design to every major experience in your life. Uh, and even death itself is now a designed experience for most people that um, they, when they die, they're put in a designed box and put in the ground with a designed marker. Um, and so you realize that our entire life is really a designed life. Um, if you think about the number of times you can close your eyes and open them in a space where you only see the natural world, you realize it's practically zero, uh, that in fact your life is inside of designed interfaces, designed environments, designed transportation systems, designed objects, designed movement. Um, it's all part of our design culture now. And so understanding design at that level is really critical to success. That if we want a good life for everyone, we have to design it. Um, and we see that if we don't design it, we fail. There really is only two, you know, it's a fork in the road, accident or design. And so we look at the, those kind of realms of design from products and experience. You think about, you know, what is um, Apple without design? It's a technology company. Uh, it wouldn't be the most valuable company in the world. Energy and movement. If you look at what, hap what is happening in energy, you know, we use the Tesla as a great example. Tesla didn't do you know, a clunky, ugly minivan with awesome technology. They did the hottest car in the world. And I have a friend who's an, a car collector, and he has Teslas and uh, he has a Tesla and a Ferrari. And he said since he got the Tesla, he doesn't touch the Ferrari. Uh, and that's really the the kind of capacity and potential of design, that we can actually make the smart new ways also the sexiest, coolest, most compelling. And that's how we'll win. We won't win by going backwards. We're not going to be better people or more altruistic. That's not a winning formula. The winning formula is to make the smartest things also the coolest. Uh, and that's where design comes in. Culture and sport, I mean, uh, uh, it's it's an absolutely explosive area of design. If you think about what the GoPro is doing to sports experience uh, and the kind of intimacy of sport, uh, of, of you know quite dramatic sports like this, uh, it's really staggering. Health and medical, of course. Um, this is actually a, an, a military application. Uh, it's an exoskeleton uh, that allows soldiers to carry you know several times their own weight. Um, but it's also being used to allow people who, you know, 
live in wheelchairs to stand for the first time. These are all people who you know, haven't had that experience before. And you can see that they're all tethered because it's really still a prototype. Um, but this is where we're going with that, with that application of design. Leisure, of course, is an extraordinary um, application of design. It's all about designing your experience uh, to experience the most beauty possible. Uh, this is an exceptional place called the Fogo Island Inn in Newfoundland. Uh, but that's, this is a kind of whole realm of design. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Even culture and events are design, more and more design spaces. That uh, These are people all getting ready for Comic-Con. Uh, the average Comic-Con uh, attendee uh, spends several hundred dollars on Etsy preparing their, their costume for the event. Uh, and ultimately, Urban Life is our biggest design project. It's our synthesis of all the other design projects uh, into one coherent experience. Um, and that is really, I mean, if you think about, you know, over half the world population now lives in cities, uh, and that that is a kind of escalating number. And it's not like the people who don't live in cities are in design-free zones. They're living in a different kind of design. And ultimately, even nature itself is a design project. The idea that we can design life is not new. We've been at it for thousands of years. Uh, if you have a dog, that dog was designed to do, it, to do what it does. Um, if you think a Labradoodle is natural, um, you, you should think again. Um, we, we design dogs uh, to be man's best friend. So that is really the kind of realm of design, that womb to tomb experience. Um, and so we asked our ourselves a question, what is it that allows us to design all those things? How do we, how do we apply design to all of that? And we realized that there's a methodology uh, that we call design thinking that is really the method for doing that, that there's a, there's a process that helps us do it. Um, and what we have in design as a, as a methodology is an ability to envision our future. So we have the ability to create an image of the future we want. Um, and we see that when we create images, we, we bring them to life. We execute the vision. Uh, and that's really the design, the kind of genius of design method, that we can envision a future and systematically execute the vision, uh, which is really a leadership method. It's a method for leading to new places. Um, and when you, when you kind of extract the design DNA and you think of it as a leadership methodology, uh, it's a really powerful opportunity. Uh, and that's what Massive Change Design is all about. That's what the, the principles of Massive Change uh, are there for, to help people apply this leadership method to their life. And what we see is the impact is really quite extraordinary. Um, a group out of um, the uh, Design Management Institute uh, has, has assembled a design-led company index. Um, and these companies, um, you know, they're, they're companies that, that satisfy very rigorous criteria for businesses that really put design at the core, not as a department or a secondary thing or something that happens after all the heavy lifting is done, but really design-led companies. And what they see is that over a 10-year period, they outperform the market by 224%. You know, which is a uh, you know not insignificant number, considering that these are already very large companies. So a 224% growth on very large businesses uh, is absolutely staggering. Now I want to sh share some some of the kind of story about how I got to be here that I think might be relevant to what we're doing. Um, I was born in Canada, northern northern Canada, about six hours north of Toronto. Um, it's minus 40 for weeks on end during the winter. That meant that our house, you know, because of where it was built, um, you know, we could not have running water in the wintertime. Um, so my job as a young man was to bring water to the, to the house. Um, we had a well in the valley, and I would go in the valley every day with my snowmobile um, and bring back and, and keep the house with water. Um, and for the longest time, I was kind of embarrassed by the whole thing. I really didn't talk about it that part of my life, that experience. Um, but I realized in my research with Massive Change that actually 
I share that experience with about 12% of the world still. But about 12% of the world still doesn't have access to clean running water. Um, and therefore, um, I have a kind of empathy with that experience that is really valuable to my life as a designer. That that experience was really profound in shaping a kind of empathy that I'm not separate from this. I'm, I'm really part of this world and the challenges that we face. Uh, I went to high school, um, but I couldn't get into college. And in high school, I was um, really interested in science and electronics. And in fact, I got 100% in, in electronics. I really loved it. Uh, but at the last minute, I decided to go to art school, uh, but couldn't get in. So I had to spend an extra year in high school uh, so that I could get into art school. I eventually went for a short time, for about 18 months, um, and had a pretty bad time there. Uh, but I became a designer um, quite by accident. Um, I discovered in art school that I loved putting words and images together, that words and images were really my métier, that uh, and that turns out to be a big part of what designers do. Uh, so I really became a communication designer. Um, and I started in a time when we were still using Gutenberg technology. We were still using hot metal type to produce our work. Uh, there was no computer in the workplace. There was no cell phones, no laptops, no internet, uh, no FedEx, no uh, Xerox machines. I mean, these were new technologies that were being introduced to the workplace. Um, it's hard to imagine today, uh, even for me who experienced it, what it would be like to work without the internet. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to fathom. Um, back then, when we did when we produced our work, if we sent it to the client, we sent it in a cab. You know, if we did an ad for a client, that that ad would take. 10 or 12 cab rides during the day uh, to the typesetter, to the printer, to the client, and back and back. And, um, and that was actually how the, how the work got produced. Now, I started in communication design. This is the first book I ever designed. And books became a real passion and love of mine. I love the idea of the book as, an, as a technology. That, you know, if, I, I say that if, you, if, we, if we invented computers first, we would use them to invent the book uh, because the book is such a powerful interface. Uh, still, no computer can really, can really compete with the speed of a book, paradoxically, that we can scan through a book at a rate that is um, almost unimaginable on a computer. Um, so that, that ability to kind of hold content in sequence, design the events, the experience, and produce the book it was a, a really significant part of my early work. Um, it became a kind of long-term collaboration. Uh, I worked with Zone Books. They were the first real client I had uh, for over 20 years and produced hundreds of projects. In the process, I became an author. That um, Zone saw me as an author. They saw me as a contributor of form as content. Um, and I saw the computer coming, and I started to realize that, you know, I realized that I had to to actually um, understand that impact, understand what it was going to mean, um, and I, in the process, I did had to do research, and to do research, I had to write, and I became an author. And so, authorship has become a big part of my work. And it's not that I set out to be an author; I didn't believe I could be. In fact, when I read books, it didn't sound like what I could do. Um, I didn't realize that editing was a big part of it. Uh, but I became an author over time, and. These are eight of the books that I authored or co-authored. Um, and um, they're all really what I call context projects. They're about what's happening in the world around me to understand where I could contribute. You know, I wanted to understand if, if the computer is going to change everything, what does that mean for me as a designer? And that became a, a really significant part of my work. Uh, this is a book published by Fiden on the, the economy of the image, the really the kind of understanding the, the image economy. It's a project that I did with Rem Kolhas and his office, OMA. Um, it's called Small, Medium, Large, Extra Large. Uh, and it really changed the kind of nature of architectural publishing. Uh, it was a book that took as its ambition the reality of design, not 
the image of design, not the, you know, the image of architectural culture where there are no people, no sex ever happens in buildings, uh, no accidents, no death. Uh, this was really to say, look, we live in a real world of uh, the, the interface between ideas and physical matter. Uh, and that's really the kind of ambition. So as I said, you know, technology was changing the world. Um, <clears throat> and that culture of books uh, became a long-term uh, a long-term project of mine. I produced um, over 260 books over time, and that <clears throat> that um, is still a, a really important part of what we do. Now, the change that we saw was a change from analog to digital. You know, from that culture of the book to the culture of digital. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that meant a really significant transformation in our world. It wasn't just a new technique. It wasn't just that we could do things faster. It fundamentally changed how we work and how we live, and especially what we see. Um, if you think about the a the analog world is really opaque. You know, it's an opaque world that you can't see into or behind. Um, so if we put up an image in that analog era, that was what people saw. They couldn't get behind the image and try to understand what's actually going on. They saw the image, and uh, you had to be a professional to really question the image and get behind it and connect the dots. But with the advent of the computer, everything is connected. We can see into things that we just couldn't see before. And the best example that we use is Nike. Nike had an awesome brand, an awesome image. But back of house, they were using child labor. And people got in there, and they connected the dots, and they stripped billions of dollars out of Nike's brand in minutes. And <clears throat> over the space of a few weeks, the, the brand was you know, connected to child labor uh, in perpetuity. Even today, if you Google child labor, Nike will come up on that first page. Now, because they're so strong in solving that problem, uh, but at first because they were so instrumental, so emblematic of the problem. But that new transparent world means that design is fundamentally changing, that we're no longer just designing an image. We're not designing what we look like. We're not designing visual style or the kind of form of things. We're actually designing what we do. We're designing the enterprise that the entire enterprise is now a design project. And we have to think of what we do as a design. We like to talk about turning off the sound. If you, if you turned off the sound and you watched what happens, is that good? Is it, what, is, is it who we want to be? Is it telling the story that we want to tell? Um, and that really pushes us to a, a fundamentally new uh, you know, practice of design with a new set of tools, a new way of thinking and working. Um, and examples of that are projects that we did over time. And these really happened organically. You know, it wasn't like I decided, you know, we we're going to do enterprise design. It was that we were doing communication design. As the world became more and more transparent, people realized, wow, everything is communicating. We really need that kind of thinking that Bruce and his team are doing to apply to our whole project. And so we worked with Seattle Public Library to really design a strategy for the future of the library in the home of Microsoft. So where Microsoft has its base, why do we need libraries um, if, if all information can be accessible? Um, and that, you know, that's a, a wonderful project. And this is a result of building by uh, Rem Kohlhaas. We worked with Frank Gehry to uh, design the Walt Disney Concert Hall and do all the communication for it. We worked with MoMA to move them into their new digs and, uh, and, and bring the brand of MoMA to life. Uh, we worked with the Jets and Giants to create their new stadium and design the experience from seat to street to think about what are, how do we design the time that we're together. Uh, if we can design the time, we can create value. And, uh, and one of the most extraordinary projects I've ever been involved in is we were commissioned to lead the design uh, of a 20-year plan for the future of Mecca uh, because they have terrible problems each year and happen again this year that hundreds of people sometimes get killed because of the design of the city, that the way that the people move around this mosque is 
really poorly designed. And so they commissioned us to redesign the movement of Mecca and therefore the, the city as a whole. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it was an absolutely incredible project that will take many decades to execute. And we worked with Imagineering to apply design to the experience of Imagineers to think about the people who create experience for Disney uh, can actually, you know, we can design their experience as a cultural experience. Um, and through all that, we created the Master Change Network um, using design as a leadership method, uh, taking on some of our thorniest challenges. Our, our realization is that, that the big problems we face are success problems, not failure problems. Um, if we failed more frequently, we would have fewer problems. The real challenge we have today is that we're 7 billion people. Um, and that is really the, why we develop these principles to kind of apply to those kinds of problems. Um, and we've now developed a methodology behind it. Um, and if the people on this, um, on this um, Hangout want to get it, we can, we can give you a kind of first level interface for this set of tools. Um, because we designed this as part of the show in Philadelphia. So what I want to do is go through some of those principles uh, briefly and show you projects that really em are emblematic of that way of thinking. Um, what we did in Philadelphia is to, um, is to really design the, the, the show around these principles and show that uh, you know, here is the principle, here's how it works, and here's an application of that principle. Um, so the first is design is leadership, inspire, and lead by design. The idea that, as I mentioned, that ultimately um, we don't do anything on our own. We're collaborators. We work together. Um, and so what we have to do is inspire people to go to a new place. Um, and our project, Massive Change, is really the kind of best example of that. Uh, and the back cover kind of says it's best. It's not about the world of design. It's about the design of the world. Um, to do that project, we start a new school. We invented a prototype of design education that was purpose-driven, entrepreneurial, experience-based design education. In other words, it wasn't about a curriculum. It was about an experience. I mean, who here you know, remembers the content of their university experience? We remember the experience of our university life. And we remember the experience of high school. Now, of course, some of the content that we reach to for solving problems, but the real content of education is experience. And so we designed Massive Change as an experience where we took on a tough project and built it. Um, and the first project that we did was a 20,000 square foot exhibition on the future of design uh, that opened in Vancouver and went to Toronto and Chicago. We looked at what we call design economies, the design of the regions of our lives that are being transformed by design. So we looked at the design of movement, the design of the market. The market isn't a natural space. It's a design space. And how we design it determines what has value and what gets exchanged. And how we design it determines the playing field on which we all work. We looked at the image economy that, in fact, the image economy is uh, ever expanding, that we've, we've created uh, a methodology for taking the entire electromagnetic spectrum and making it our eyeball. So this is a diagram of the spectrum and what you see in color is what we see with our naked eye. All the other information, all the other images are data. They're, they're tools that we've invented to use wavelengths across the spectrum from radio waves to gamma waves uh, to turn the universe into visual information that we can see. In the end, what we realized was that we're really designing wealth. We're redesigning what wealth means today. And that means new f all kinds of new currencies, new forms of wealth. Um, and this was really you know, looking at the wealth of mobility, the wealth of information, the wealth of access, uh, the wealth of knowledge. These are, these are new currencies. And now, of course, we have this flourishing of new currency design uh, with <clears throat> blockchain, et cetera. Uh, but that's, that's the real project. Um, and we now developed a methodology. When we did that project, the biggest complaint was that people were excited and they wanted to do it, but they, they didn't know how. And so the, the, the 24 principles of master change 
are really how to do it. And that's what we are sharing now. <coughs> Excuse me. The next principle is that we're not separate from or above nature. And this is not our insight. This is really understanding that this is a principle that changes all design. The idea that we're somehow above nature is an artifact of the past, that um, it's just not supported by science. We understand now that we are nature. Um, and so this is a project in Panama. It's a new Museum of Biodiversity. Again, a collaboration with Frank Gehry. And our work was really to design the mandate uh, from the inside out. So we, we kind of worked with the, with the science team and the team in Panama to design the mandate for the institution and then bring that mandate out to the story, to the experience, and ultimately uh, to the environment uh, of the project itself. Um, the project starts with what we call a panorama. It's an environment where it's like you could stand in a glass box and we could take that box and dip it down into the ocean. Uh, and we could go through the ocean and see the different environments and the kind of impact of Panama. We could move up into the mangroves and into the forest and into the jungle and up into the canopy. And you can see all the different experiences of the biodiversity of Panama. And you can understand that, in fact, if you wanted to do a, 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 an experiment in biodiversity at the biggest scale, you would do Panama because it creates, it takes two ocean ecologies and joins them together into one. Uh, and so this is the panorama. Um, <clears throat> that, that connectedness, when it happened, it created what is called the Great Biotic Interchange. And that's what this, ex this experience is. You come into a room where there's a stampede happening in both directions. That animals are moving north and animals are moving south. All different kinds of species. Um, and it's a technique that we call devices of wonder. We create something that is awe-inspiring in a way that makes you wonder what on earth is, you know, how did this come to be? What is this thing? And once that happens, we can answer all your questions uh, because we've got you into a frame of mind of exploring. <clears throat> uh, the next principle is begin with fact-based optimism. As designers, we can't afford the luxury of cynicism. You know, we can't accept that things are going to be worse. Uh, I've never met a designer or an entrepreneur, for that matter, who wakes up in the morning and says, you know, our idea is to make things worse. No, we believe in the possibility of, of solving problems, but we are based in data. We are based in fact. It's not an altruistic idea. It's actually a fact-based idea. Um, and the facts, in this case, are radically on our side. You know, for, uh, for centuries, and in fact for millennia, we've been solving problems and, and, and winning. And that's the reason that we have so many new problems. As I said, our new problems are success problems, not failure problems. Um, so as an example of this principle, um, this is a letter that arrived on my desk from the Minister of Education in Guatemala. Um, they explained that they had had 36 years of civil war, that, <clears throat> that they had... Over, over those 36 years, wiped out in their people the ability to dream. That um, they, uh, they, had to, um, they had to recover an ability to imagine a future that was positive. Uh, and that was really the challenge that they gave us. So when I went to Guatemala, uh, they introduced me to the vice president. They said, Bruce, this is Bruce, and he's going to redesign Guatemala. And I said, guys, time out. I didn't say anything of the sort. Uh, it's not what we promised. It's not what we talked about. Um, the only people who are going to redesign Guatemala are Guatemalans. We can help. We have tools to help. We can advance your work, but ultimately, it's your work. Uh, and they said, well, we want to change the name of the country. And I said, why would you want to do that? I mean, you guys really think big. And they said, well, uh, when this, you know, the place was called Guate. When the, when the Spanish got here, they hated it. So they called it Guatemala, which is like bad place. And how would you like to wake up every day in the United States of bad place? And so I said, well, you got a point. And so we added an extra A to the name and created Guate Amala, which is the love of Guate, and created the movement for the love of Guate, and ultimately a movement that would expand out beyond Guatemala to the love of, uh, you know, the love of movement. And uh, it's been an absolutely extraordinary experience. It was based on this insight from Stuart Brand. 
that ultimately, if things are, if you think things are getting worse, you behave selfishly. But if you see people investing in the future, you want to be part of it. And so that's such an important insight in our era when so much of what we're doing is invisible. So much of the good that we do is invisible, but the bad that we do is in our face every day. That, you know, if we, if we publish a newspaper called Reality, it would be a mile thick, and the first quarter inch is the New York Times, and it scares the living daylights out of you, and you want to close your doors, and you want to be selfish, and you want to lock people out in, 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 because of fear. Uh, but the rest of the mile of that paper is massive change. The rest of the model is what people at Fab Labs are doing, that we're creating solutions to all sorts of problems. Uh, and we're collaborating and across boundaries like never before, across languages, across religions, across cultures, across national borders. Um, and that's what we're really doing. So we developed this very simple strategy, three-part strategy, so it, show it's already happening, so people can actually understand that we're doing it, provide tools for change, help you know, help advance, advance their work, accelerate it, uh, and connect the world to Guatemala. And when we said that, they thought we meant that connect people from around the world to help Guatemala. And what we really meant was that, of course, but also that ultimately Guatemala is going to solve problems that other people are, set, are, are facing. You know, we have a problem of violence in Chicago. So do the Guatemalans. They're solving theirs. They're working on it. They're, they're developing solutions. We need to know what's happening. And, and so we developed our project around what we call the culture of life. What we realized in, is that in, in 36 years of civil war, they had, they had the culture of death. Most of the people in the country had, had only experienced that. They, they had no experience of not war. And so we realized that you can't just turn off the culture of death and turn on the culture of life. You have to build it. You have to design it. And, and we designed what we call the nine cultures of life, that these nine areas, you know, the culture of dreams, that you actually need a culture of the ability to dream. We take for granted as designers that we can imagine the future, but they can't because they haven't. And, and every effort to think of the future was dominated by violence, poverty, and corruption. So you need a culture of dreams. You need a culture of prosperity, <clears throat> diversity, of justice, of innovation, etc. <clears throat> and they launched it with an extraordinary experience in Guatemala City, where they kind of took over the uh, one of the main traffic circles and created a kind of Roman forum, where in that space uh, there was this extraordinary party going on, uh, and inside a, 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 an experience of the nine cultures. Uh, and when you came around and when you went through those nine cultures, you came out into this kind of pantheon of leaders who were changing Guatemala. You know, we featured 200 leaders who were transforming Guatemala. And it had a really profound effect and it continues to do so. Um, one of the coolest things that I thought they did was this little thing that they created a bracelet that was like a rubber, it was just a rubber band. Uh, and it came with this little card that explained that if you had a bad thought about Guatemala, you should pull the band as far as possible and then let it go. Um, the next principle is design the invisible. Most design is not visual. It's not visible to us. Most design that supports your way of living uh, is the underlying invisible design that creates your experience. Um, and so we were commissioned by Coca-Cola um, to design the business for perpetuity. Not the image of it, but rather how do we do Coca-Cola in a way that we can do it forever? Uh, because we don't want to do it in a way that is contrary to the brand. If the brand is all about positivity and a positive future, why would we do things that are negative? And so it was really a, uh, a commission to understand the entire global enterprise of Coca-Cola as a design challenge to get to perpetuity or, or sustainability. And it was an absolutely extraordinary experience. It led to a collaboration with a little company called Emico uh, and the development of a new material um, that would take um, PET bottles out of the environment that Emico had for 50 years been making aluminum chairs. And, and Coca-Cola approached them and said, look, could you make the chair out of a new material that would take up PET bottles? 
that led to a, a collaboration with with Emico on their brand and design and company uh, that starts from this concept. First, let's make things that last. So rather than thinking about recycling, let's make awesome things that we want forever. Uh, it's a great challenge that really takes us to a new place. Um, and that new chair was part of that because, of course, it's using recycled materials and it's recyclable itself. Um, but it take, every one of those chairs takes 111 PET bottles out of the environment. Um, and so far, this is, a, this is a presentation that we did at, at, in the Milan Fair. Um, and at that point, we'd already taken 3.5 million. Now we've taken over 16 million PET bottles out of the environment. Um, quantify and visualize is another principle. We have the power to visualize. As designers, we have the power to use the visual to help people understand how to make better decisions. Um, <clears throat> and so we've been working with um, a group called Personal Black Box out of New York. It's a big data um, technology innovator uh, that's a startup. That and we're designing the whole enterprise as a business. So we're not only working on the design of the interface, but really work applying design to the way the business is designed. Um, and the promise of this is that we we can actually allow people to own their data. So right now, the way that the world you know the data world works is that there's a black market in your data that when you move around on the internet, you're leaving data everywhere. And that data is being gathered and cut and paste and, and, and uh, put together without your knowledge. And it's being sold without your knowledge. And it's being sold to people who use it to market to you. Uh, and you don't get the benefit or the income from that. Um, we've designed a method where people can actually own the data that they create, control over that data, assemble a much richer data set because it's their own, C control the quality and the precision of that data and who has access to it, and get the money directly to them. Uh, what it means for brands is that they have access, uh, you know, people provide access to that data on a voluntary basis, so it's a completely different relationship with brands and a, and a much higher quality of experience and analytics. It starts with the design of trust, that the business is actually designed as a business and a trust. So we never see the data. The data is all held in the trust. We only have analytics, and that analytics protects you, your personal information and your data. So only people who you choose to can see it who really has access and control. Uh, we call a digital mirror. It's a way to see yourself so that you have the benefit of the analytics, so you have first access to the possibilities of learning in your data. Um, we give you tools to manage it so that we can actually see what's happening, and you can set goals in your life. You can uh, you know, define accomplishments that you want help with, uh, and you can really understand and manage the data that you have. And ultimately, you can monetize that data. You can, um, you can allow access to the analytics while rem remaining private. Uh, so no one ever actually sees who you are. They just see the type of person you are and what your ambition is. Uh, and it allows brands to provide offers and opportunities uh, and payments and incentives for you to engage in, uh, in, their, in their engagement in your uh, objectives. So it's a really fundamental new data technology. Um, and finally, I want to talk about um, design the platform for constant design. You know, we most often think of the object of our work as a singular, um, you know, deliverable, a singular thing that we're going to deliver, that it's ultimately going to be done, that we're going to design something, it's going to be produced, and that will be our design. And what we realize now over time is that that's not how the world works now. We're actually designing platforms. Our real work is iteration. Our real work is multiple design applications over time. This is really very common in a software world, but less common in the rest of the world. That if you think about um, what we're doing, um, you know, I've done so many projects in my early life where I was absolutely certain that 
we were smarter than the last people who solved the problem and that we would solve it for good and that this time we were going to get it right. Uh, and I realize now that, in fact, that's not the design problem. The real design problem is, over time, how do we design what we're doing as a solution that can be iterated and improved over time? It's really about designing a platform. Um, and so we've been working with a company called Freeman now uh, for uh, about two years. Um, I started as a consultant uh, and recently took on the role in a strategic alliance with the Massive Change Network and Freeman as the chief design officer. So I'm really applying design to Freeman as an enterprise. Um, and Freeman is a business that produces over half of the major trade shows and exhibits every year in America. So if you think about um, all the trade shows and exhibits from CES to Comic-Con and everything in between, um, Freeman produces those experiences. Um, and it's an absolutely extraordinary company. It is the fab lab of all fab labs. You know, we have 7,000 people producing things uh, and creating new things every day and making massive change happen. We, we bring new ideas to market. We, we build the interface between new ways of living and working and new products and new ideas and the people who make those things happen and the marketplace of ideas. Um, and so that's really the, the collaboration. It's been an extraordinary opportunity. Um, and we're, I feel like we're just getting started, and I'm going to show you some of the things that we're doing. Um, you know, when, when we first got, got um, involved, uh, Freeman explained that these were their values, that these, these, um, these were the core values of the company, and that um, everything that we do is really um, in support of and, and driven by these values. Um, and when I looked at them closely, I realized, wow, these are my values, first of all. And these are design values. If you want to be a designer, this is the simplest formula I've ever seen. You need integrity because you can't work on the right problem if you're not honest. I have to be honest with my client and tell them what I think the real problem is. Otherwise, I'm just stealing their money. I have to have empathy to understand what are people really experiencing and how do I, uh, how do I understand that and and, and experience it with them so that I can really help them. Ultimately, I need to innovate. I can't really design solutions uh, if they're not new. Um, existing solutions are already there and available. That's not design, it's production. Uh, if you want to solve new problems, you need innovation. Um, enthusiasm, of course, you know, optimism is key to design methodology. We have to be optimistic as a, as a methodology. Uh, and finally, performance excellence. You can't have excellence except by design. You can't actually have, you can't reach goals by accident, uh, you know, unless you have infinite amount of time. So it's really only by performance excellence that we can expect uh, to, to have real impact. Uh, and that's, that's driven by design. So what we're doing with Freeman is actually designing a methodology that improves all the design. So we're really designing an underlying methodology uh, that is a design thinking process. And it's designed to capture the intelligence and creativity of each project. We do thousands of projects each year. No one does more. Uh, if we learn by doing, no one can learn more than us. Um, and we can integrate new things. And so this. This methodology starts with opportunity. That is, you know, a moment to actually scale the scale the potential. Take a step back and understand what the what's the real problem, what's the real potential, real opportunity. Um, and then it moves to formulate, where we actually, you know, solve that problem that we've defined. You know, create solutions. We build it. We execute it. Uh, and then we learn. We debrief. We we design a way to prepare for the next cycle. So rather than simply learning, it's also learning as a preparation for the next phase of design innovation. Um, and it's setting up the next opportunity. Uh, it's a, it's a you know, fundamental change in the way that we understand design. So what it means is that we're rethinking the experience and rethinking how the, 
and how the whole business works from the basic systems that support experience to the interfaces that people can use to do them. So imagine that we are designing systems where people can actually model the experiences that they're creating and then put those models into a digital space, put people into that digital space and, and see what happens and run that model so that we can refine and, def and redesign the space before we build it uh, to, get the, to accomplish the goals that we set at the outset. So when we got involved in this, we thought, how do we actually quantify this face-to-face -face as a new medium? You know, how do we think about that experience and how it intersects with the digital quantitative world? If you think about what's happening in digital, it's ever increasingly quantified. We're going to finer and finer digital increments of time and attention. Whereas in the physical space, we still have good feeling. We have very little, you know, under, very little uh, in the way of metrics of what's actually happening. But fortunately, there's a really exciting new scientific area of development that's really looking at um, experience and starting to quantify quantify that experience. And so we're really trying to understand. How do we use this new science uh, and bring it together with face-to-face -face experience and, and really design the, the kind of synthesis of digital and physical to produce the behaviors that we are looking for, to really understand what's happening when we do that? And so what we defined is a project to design a new medium. And I think of it like the beginning days of television. If you think about the early days of TV. I mean, you watch that stuff. It was totally crazy. People had no idea what they were doing. They were inventing new formats. They were inventing new ways of communicating, new ways of connecting, new formats of communication. Um, and that's what's happening right now in face-to-face, -face, uh, that we have this kind of new medium that is a five senses medium. It's not, it's not a one you know, or two sense medium. It's really you know, fundamental. And so if you think about that, most of the media today and you know, the traditional media that we call is, is really what we're doing now. It's, it's sight and sound. So you're seeing something and you're hearing something, and that's as good as we can do. But in face-to-face, -face, we have sight and sound, of course. We have both of those in very powerful ways. But we also have taste and smell and touch, and those senses go directly into the nervous system. They go to the base of the brain. They go to areas of the brain that are fundamental in decision making. And so it's a, if we can design in this new way, we can design a powerful new medium of communication uh, that is really extraordinary. And we started to look at it to say, well, you know, if you think about traditional digital, it's two senses. But what we do is really the five sense immersive experience. There's no more powerful experience that we can create. If you think about you know, being in a, in a rock concert and the kind of experience that moves your body, that we can, we can move your body and immerse you in a sensory experience that you'll never forget. I mean, I may not remember much of the content of high school, but I certainly do remember the Guess Who and Kiss and Nazareth. I mean, those were experiences that I'll never forget. Um, so if we think about what the, you know, we look at digital and we think, wow, that's a really, you know, cool thing. We can, you know, we can make a camera that has maybe, you know, 30 megapixels. But your eye has 576 megapixels. So that is an entirely different order of magnitude of experience. You know, Jobs talked about making things that are, you know, the people want to lick, that they want to taste it. But we actually have 10,000 taste buds, and we can give you a food experience that actually is part of the idea. You know, a home theater sound system is 150 watts at the kind of upper end, but we can produce 15,000 watts that will physically move you. And I just received this in a note from Peter Diamandis, this extraordinary quotation that for me is just like, 
uh, confirmation that we are on the right track, that all five human senses will become part of the normal computing experience, that artificial intelligence will begin to sense and use all five senses. Um, the sense of touch, smell, and hearing will become prominent in the use of AI. Uh, this is from Stephen Gold from IBM Watson. It will begin to process all that additional incremental information. When applied to our computing experience, we will engage in a much more intuitive and natural ecosystem that appeals to all of our senses, which is exactly what we're designing. We're designing that interface. So if you have concepts for how digital and physical come together, which I imagine is a big idea at Fab Labs, um, we want to hear from you. We want to know about it. Um, that's what we're working on uh, in, in, at Freeman. So that is uh, work on what you love. Um, that, those are the principles, as I said, of massive change design. Um, and that's where I will um, end my presentation and open the floor to questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Bruce. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I like, I like to welcome, to welcome Neil, 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 Neil to the hangout. To the hangout. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Hi. Very nice to see you. Uh, nice to see uh, you. Nice Can you stop your presentation? Nice you. Oh, yeah. sure. Um, how do I do that? Um, um, yeah. I did it. There we yeah. go. Okay. Good. There Thank you. Thank you for joining us through the impact of design. Thank you. Um, and I, I have both a, a story that's a question. Okay. Um, Center for Bits and Atoms looks at turning data into things and things into data, which spawn the How to Make Anything class, which spawn the Fab Lab Network. And in the Fab Academy, we teach 2D CAD, 3D CAD, circuit design, microcode, all as design. Um, a few years ago, I did a keynote for IDSA, the Industrial Design Association meeting, and I, I yelled at them. <laughs> I, I, I said, you can no longer think of design as the shape of a thing. There's a new notion of design, which is function at all levels of description, where you don't have diff you know, segregate to team. So you know how to do all of that. You need to integrate and design all of that. And then afterwards, they had planned a, a, like a, a smaller session with me, and I expected people to be cranky for me yelling at them. But instead, they were metaphorically and literally in tears and saying things like, all my life I wanted to do it, but they wouldn't let me. Yeah. And um, th these leading designers weren't <coughs> excuse me, clear on who they were. Um, but wanted to design across scale, but they wouldn't let them. And so the question is how you think about design of microcode and design of circuits and design of materials as a coherent, integrated skill embodied in a person versus an organization, or sort of the future of levels of description of design. Design uh -huh. function. Uh -huh. That's a great question. Um, there, are there are a couple of answers, that are, or at least a couple of dimensions of the answer. Um, I think that, that, you know, I gave a lecture at Cooper Hewitt on why, de why designers' voices are suddenly in the most important conversations. And what you realize is that those designers really come from um, a compassion for the user, a, an obsession with the user, which is really a caring for the citizen. So they, they come from the their obsession and their their culture is really looking at the citizen or the user um, and trying to understand how to make their life better. So they start from that very compassionate place. Um, there's a natural extension to the community. To say if I'm if I care about the user, I care about their community. If I care about the community, I care about the environment. And, and so you see designers very heavily involved in the environmental movement, in the, you know, in the consideration of the environment, and in the, in the development of sustainability as a methodology. And designers are carrying sustainability into businesses. That's where it's largely, or at least often, coming from. So 
Um, so I think you're you're right on in the in that in that they need to think like that. They need to think about. They need to think holistically, um, and that creates a real challenge in today's world where the com the level of complexity is so great. It's really hard to master the bodies of work that you need to understand in order to be able to work holistically. And so what we designed really is a methodology uh, for the leadership, holistic leadership methodology for that part of it. But it rests on um, what we call renaissance teams. So designers need to be part of collaborative teams that can actually as a team take on those challenges that you described because individuals can't. Individuals, I mean with rare, rare, rare exception, um, you can't master multiple bodies of knowledge today. That you can have a good understanding and a connection of them but you can't really master a kind of um, uh, a, a, an application of them. But you I can master I back a bit on that though. Um, I think Part of emerging bits and atoms is changing notions of literacy. So um, I've had a series of students who have had exceptional impact, like Kenny Chung set the world's record for highest performance ultralight materials, and NASA created an, a new job class for him to build spaceships. And Rafi Krikorian ended up creating the whole platform of, at Twitter. And both were really designers. They they act, look, and think like designers, but but sort of they they master new notions of literacy. And I both love and hate the word design because it's a way of working I revere, but it also is a way to sort of build a fence and segregate a, a, a canonical sense of literacies. And I'd push back a bit that the the, the increasing malleability of the physical world is turning into a broader notion of literacy with a richer notion of design that's not well served by traditional things that use the word design. I would say, I mean, I, I totally agree, um, but I think that, um, and that's for me why the, the, the massive change design principles, you'll, if, you, if you go through that, that methodology, you see it's actually really holistic. It's really thinking about the biggest problems and, and, and being immodest and willing to take those on, to say, look, they're the great challenges that we face are the biggest opportunities that we face. Um, and we can and will think about them and solve them. And so we can take diseases off the face of the earth. We can invent entirely new methods for transportation and energy. Um, we can and will do these things. But you also have to um, understand a collaborative methodology within that way of thinking that ultimately to do that, we're going to need a team that can do what no individual can do. You know, to really solve those problems, we're going to need that team. And so you need that double, you, know, you need both. You need a willingness to be audaciously ambitious and to cross all the boundaries. I mean, I was fortunately not educated. And so uh, I never actually learned where the boundaries were exactly. Uh, so I didn't have not that I didn't respect them, I didn't. I wasn't aware of them, um, and so I just went where I had to go. Um, so you need that ability to go where you need to go, without boundary, but you also need a respect to say, "Wow, like I've learned that in fact there are people who they they have deep expertise, and we need that expertise, and we need them to have also the openness to collaborate." Right. I think the way I would say it is. Absolutely, you need depth and you need teams, but in the deep teams, one of the skills isn't the designer. They're, they're all, in it, they're all they're designers. All, yes. And you don't that, want to segregate the design as one member of a team. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're doing at Freeman. The, the, I mean, the, the embrace of this way of thinking at Freeman is like nothing I've ever seen in my life. And we're really designing the company and designing the collaboration and designing the method that we collaborate with and we have declared that we are all designers right that the ceo is a designer and the president's a designer and the the uh, people doing the production in our fab lab 
you know, we have the most awesome fab lab in the world. We have 26 fab labs <laughs> and uh, where people put together the most amazing things. And we intend to make it even more amazing. Uh, and we'll do that if we think of all of us as designers. Right. Okay, good. So with that, why don't we open up the questions from all the people sitting in. And I'll yeah. drop off the video, but listen into the discussion. So, Interesting uh, discussion. Sure. Go ahead, but we have some questions from, from the audience. Elia de Tomasi asks, if, do you think it makes sense to bring the design of, uh, into the places of production, or, or will, will it still win a formula to draw in London, design in London, produce in China, for example? I think more and more we'll synthesize the two. More and more we'll make and you know, we'll make the idea and we'll make the product together. That I mean, that's the promise of digital, and um, and I think that more and more those things become one. And if you think about, you know, all my life, um, I made production a design creative work. So I I didn't stop design once we had once we went into production. I kept designing, and saw the production as a creative methodology, and that's why I was able to do things that no one else would do, uh, because I learned early that that making things was a creative process. It, it shouldn't be just production. It shouldn't be devoid of it. OK, I have more questions. But, uh, Victor Freund from Peru, uh, two questions. One is, how did you deal with the, when you started your company with the egos of so many people, the ego fights? And then, um, as a designer, which has been the more difficult decisions you have made in your company? Uh huh. Um, that's a really great question. Um, how do we deal with the egos? I think that um, you know the, the the methodology of design that we developed is is a generous methodology. So we allow leadership to to be embraced by whoever is the leader. So just because I'm the most senior person or the, the um, even the most knowledgeable or the um, or the owner you know the, the kind of person who runs the business I don't own the leadership at every moment um, and some projects the youngest person in the studio led those big projects because at that moment they had what it takes to do it and you know as a as a leader you have to accept that you're not going to lead all the time. And you have to support people who clearly are in a moment of leadership. Uh, and that can happen for any reason. It can happen to anybody. Uh, so you, you need a methodology that supports that. Um, and if you look at the Incomplete Manifesto for Growth, mm -hmm. that was really a kind of articulation of that way of thinking to say, look, this is a collaborative work. What's the likelihood of me being right all the time? It's really low. So, uh, so uh, let's use the power of our team. Let's use the power of our collaboration. And that means sometimes the client can be the leader. Sometimes we can be the leader. Sometimes the youngest person can be the leader. Sometimes the senior person can be. Uh, it's, it's everyone. Um, and then the second, um, the second one was um, you know, difficult decisions. Um, you know, there have been some tough decisions, some, um, some real failure. And part of the, you know, part of the, the challenge of living a design life is you know, making failure something that you're familiar with and that you can handle and that you understand is part of your work when you're doing new things. You know, you can't do new things and succeed every time. And in fact, if you, you know, one of the things that's really interesting at um, uh, at um, uh, Pixar is they not only measure failure, they insist on it. They quantify failure, and if a team isn't failing some of the time, they change the team. Because if you're just succeeding, it's production. It's no longer design. You, know, you have to understand failure as part of your work. And so 
and you have to build the way to survive it. You need you need the fortitude in your own resilience to survive failure. And so there have been some really tough decisions, and um, you know, closing down projects and um, and just accepting, you know, what we can't succeed with this. Um, and ultimately, selling the business, I think, was for me a really tough choice. You know, I sold Bruce Mao Design uh, in order to do the Massive Change Network. And that decision to say, you know what, I have to do that to get to the next place. I can't keep doing this. I need to do something new. Uh, and to do something new, I have to shut that off. I have to, to step out. Um, and that was probably the most difficult choice that I had to make. Uh, but it's turned out to be like an absolutely extraordinary experience, and you know I'm starting something new, which is the most exciting thing you can do in life. Thanks. Um, I keep going. I have a couple more questions. Uh, Cindy Kotala, um, she tackles the issue of the technological lock-in and how we are, especially in energy and mobility. Um, we still depend on centralized and big power structures. Well, how we deal with them, um, you know, how do you deal with them in the a massive change of how we can deal with them as a grassroots movement and so on? Um, it's a great question, um, and it's a real problem. I mean, um, every business faces this. It's not only at the big scale of, this, of our society, but it's also, you know, a business like Freeman has all kinds of systems in place that are working incredibly well. You know, that's why they're so successful. Um, but to get to the next level, we have to we have to disrupt ourselves. And I think that more and more people are understanding that that's where the big opportunities are. That that we have to embrace that disruption because it's either going to come from us or it's going to happen to us. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to be part of that, we have to figure out how to do it. To do that, we have to move from, um, like I think of the big systems as monocultures. In the same way in agriculture, we have monocultures. The answer isn't a new monoculture. Like our, our solution to one monoculture isn't another one. Like if you look at education, we have a terrible monoculture in education. The solution that everyone is searching for that there's certain is out there is a you know the kind of silver bullet of a new monoculture but the real solution is an ecology of innovation an ecology you know a diverse ecology of innovation and development it's not one it's not betting on a new one it's actually understanding that we're going to we're going to diversify and and really develop the strength of an ecological solution um, and that's, you know, somehow that's how, how we have to get to, what we have to get to. Okay, I have the last question from the audience. Uh, Mira from Singapore, actually. Um, she talks about that there are more, more than five sentences, almost nine, according to research. Um, time or perception being one of them. Should designers keep that factor sense of time in consideration first while problem solving? As all problems are situational, contextual to the time and the moment, it's a very good question in relation to the <laughs> recent discovery of space and time effects of gravitational waves, I guess. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, that's an awesome question. And it's one that, um, you know, my answer is definitively yes. That, like, I've thought for a long time that what I really design is time. I like the very first books that I did were designed as objects that unfold in time. Right? So they're physical <laughs> objects that occupy space, but the real experience is in time. So graphic design in that context is a kind of stupid way of understanding what we do. We're not graphic designers, we're event designers. And so when I look at, at what I'm doing now with Freeman, with, with almost all the work that I'm doing, it's all really about designing the time of experience. And so, yes, um, you know, the, the five senses, um, I want to go to nine. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> if there are more, we want them. 
uh, yes, the idea that ultimately it's about designing five senses over time, which may open up new senses. But that is, that's the real design project. Now what that means that's really exciting that we're working on is what does a design methodology of time look like? What does a design, how do you design all five senses? How do we synthesize that into one design methodology? It's really a new practice. Absolutely. Um, I have uh, just a final question, and that's, that's from myself. Uh, looking at your career, and uh, now you are influencing um, big players in order to change their policy and their approach to reality and how we can change that reality. Um, taking that road that you have taken to, of that path, um, there, were, were those your aspirations when you started? And um, connected to that, which would be the aspirations for new designers huh. in this new context? You know, it's interesting because I wasn't that politically tuned in when I first started work. And I was, um, I lived in northern Canada as, you know, on a farm. Um, you know, I saw the rest of the world through the television set for the first time. And I'd never been out of my hometown. So when I went to college, it was my first experience of a city. Um, I was just absolutely delighted to be there. <laughs> and I was, I was excited to be part of this world that was happening. Uh, and so it took me a while to understand that, wow, what I'm doing has impact. What I'm doing is affecting the world. And so pretty soon, you know, within a couple of years, I realized that I was working on things that I didn't agree with. And I was working in a corporate design firm in London, and I was doing things that you know, I, I realized, you know, I'm building a prison that I'm going to be put into. And why would I do that? Why shouldn't I use my design to make the world a better place? And I had this, this kind of realization that, that it wasn't very complex politically, but I knew that I worked really hard, and I didn't want that hard work to go to things that I didn't believe in. And so the first company that I started was called Public Good. And it was a very simple idea. We're going to use this, our work, our design work, to advance things that we think are helping the world. And it was really interesting to me that the response in the design community was anger and resentment. Who do you think you are? Why do you think you can do what you love? And I, I thought it was a kind of crazy response. First of all, they thought it was a critique of them. And I didn't really care about that. I, I wasn't about that. I, I was, it was about me. I, I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to have a good life for myself. I wanted my work to go to something that I believed in. Um, now, and this was you know before the NGO movement. This was 30 years ago. Now, what's so cool is that there's so many more options that it's really commonplace for young people to say, I want my work to make a positive impact in the world. That's not a radical statement anymore. That's, that's a common statement. And so I think it's, it's really important and exciting that more and more people can say that from the beginning, that we can teach that as an idea, that ultimately that's the fundamental idea of design, that our real purpose is to solve the problems that we face. And you know, when, when we presented Massive Change in Vancouver, I did an interaction with a high school like this, you know, a, 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 a video conference, and um, I described best the idea of massive change that came from an extraordinary quotation by um, Lester B. Pearson, and in his Nobel lecture, he quotes on Toynbee, who's a British historian, and Toynbee said that the 20th century won't be remembered either for um, violence and conflict or technology and innovation. That ultimately, it's not technology and innovation or violence and conflict that will define the 20th century. Ultimately, it will be remembered as an era in which we dared to imagine the welfare of the entire human race as a practical objective. That was his quote. 
when I read that, I thought, wow, that's the biggest idea I've ever seen, I've ever heard. I mean, it's like, it blew my mind. I thought, wow, that is awesome. That's what I think I'd like to do. That's what I think I am doing. That's what I think most of my designer, most of the designers I know, they might not say it like that, but th that is what they're trying to do. Um, and when he said a, a practical objective, he made it a design problem, not a utopian vision. So I presented that to this group of high school students. And one of the students said, you're not thinking big enough. And I said, well, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's all mankind. I mean, it's a big idea. I thought it was the biggest I'd ever heard. Um, I mean, that's big. And they said, well, take out all of mankind and put in all of life. That's our project. That's the 21st century. And I was just blown away. I thought, who is this kid? I mean, like, how, <laughs> like, how is that happening in high school today? Uh, but that's what's, like, that is, he's absolutely right. I had a blind spot because I was seeing it from the old perspective that, yes, mm -hmm. our, that's our project. But the fact, our real project is designing all of life. And more and more people realize that's that's what we need to do. We need to design so that the welfare of all of life is our practical objective. Last question. Is everyone a designer and why? I think everyone is a designer, um, sometimes passively or, or unconsciously, let's say. Um, but you design your life. You design the life you have. You have an opportunity to design it, and most people take that opportunity and design it to some degree. The people who design it most aggressively and, and you know, fully embrace the fact that they are designers have the life that they want. They produce the life that they want to experience. They produce the world that they want to live in. You know, they engage in the world the way they want to engage in it. Um, but everyone at the lowest, you know, at the at the lowest level of, of engagement is still making choices and setting agendas and imagining their future and working towards it, whether that is you know saving for retirement or getting an education or getting a new job or you know, all of those things. They are envisioning a future and executing the vision. Mm -hmm. They can use massive change design tools to do that more effectively, to produce it more rapidly, to have a bigger impact, to do it more consciously. And that's really what we're working on. OK, I think that's a, that's a perfect wrap-up. Um, thank you very much, Bruce, for joining us. Um, thank you for sharing your visions with the FabLab Network. And I don't know if you have anything else to share, be my guest. Thank you. I'm just absolutely thrilled. I, I think it was uh, it was great to to meet you and to see what you're doing. Um, and I would say, if anybody wants to forward ideas or things that we ought to be looking at, um, more than happy to receive that. I, I'm not sure how I do that, but uh, um, I'm open for that. Thank you so much. I will I will make sure that we get connected more often uh, with you and your work. I think it's a perfect match. So I think that's it for this Hangout. Um, see you all next week. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Thank you. Bye-bye, world. Bye. <laughs>